Okay, so can I say to the British voice, thank you very, very much for joining me. <laughs> You're welcome. Would you How like are you to... today? Oh, I'm pretty good, thank you. Pretty good. Just back from walking the dog. Um, would you like to introduce yourself to anyone who may have heard your voice but may not uh, have seen you before? Okay, yeah. So my name is Ian Russell. I'm a voice actor. I'm British, as hopefully you can tell. And uh, I, I stumbled upon branding myself as the British voice when I landed here with the, in the United States. I live in the United States. Um, uh, and I naively thought that there wouldn't be many British voice actors in the United States. So I thought, oh, but I'll be the British voice and I'll be the British voice. So uh, uh, that's how that all came about. Um, but uh, it's not like that. <laughs> one of my... One of my one of my, a, a friend, I'll call him a friend, but uh, we 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 end up um, competing for the same work quite often. Um, a guy called uh, Mike Cooper lives fifty miles up up the road from me. <laughs> we get together and and have a coffee and all that kind of thing. But uh, so they're we're everywhere uh, if you look hard enough. Um, so how will you know me? Um, the vast majority of voiceover work is unseen, really. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's corporate films and e-learning for for companies and all that kind of thing. Uh, it, where you'll see or hear voiceovers publicly, you know, the TV, the radio, social media ads now, um, uh, video games and, and animation. Those are the, the big things. And probably the publicly facing the thing that I'm best known for is a video game character called Locke uh, in a game called Payday 2. Uh, but he's not British. Oh, which is kind of odd. He's yeah. from South Africa, so I speak with a sort of a very bad South African accent for him. <laughs> so that's that's Lock. In fact, my recording studio, which is just off to my left here, is called the Lock Box. Ah, uh, named I, after Lock. Named after Lock. Yeah, when I when I bought it, I ran a poll uh, through my Twitter account for for Lock, uh, and that was the name that they picked. So that's what it's called. Fantastic. And you've, you've won multiple awards for voice acting. So you are a standout as a British voice actor. Uh, yeah, I have. Um, so this year I won um, a male gaming performance of the year. And mm -hmm. uh, so these are the three awards that I've won are all from a, a, a an awards thing called the One Voice Awards. Mm -hmm. um, there is another one, a major one, which is called the SOVAS, Society of Voice Arts. I have been nominated, but not won there. Um, for, for, for the uninitiated, um, I kind of think of the One Voice Awards as a bit like BAFTA mm. and the SOVAS as a bit like the Oscars. Okay. It's, it's the, you know, One Voice is significant, but if you know, SOVAS is a bit harder to win it's, it's a, and probably a bit more. The One Voice people probably don't agree with that, but <laughs> and, <laughs> and I've not to diminish the fact that I've won them. You know, I'm very delighted and honoured. So, so this year I I was nominated five times and I won the 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 gaming the male gaming award. Um, uh, that was for Payday for the character of Locke. Uh, last year uh, I had three nominations and I won two of them. I won the animation performance. Uh, for a, a vulture cartoon character in a kids show called Badanamu Cadets uh, and I also won the overall voice of the year award which was came as an enormous shock to me um, yeah. so those are the three awards that I've won um, okay. uh, and for a, for a Brit in a box in the middle of metaphorical nowhere South Carolina it, that, I, it still seems slightly surreal to me that uh, a, if you like an awards show which is largely based out of the uk and focused at least initially was focused on on british talent uh that that you know i got noticed mm. <laughs> <laughs> not that i'm complaining i'm really not no. <laughs> <laughs> i'm interested that you said there's quite a few british voice artists say, in the united states yeah why do you think british voices are in demand uh well I, I you know it's, it's perhaps slightly to do with the empire mm. uh you know we 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 owned half the world at one time and i think that the british voice still lands with um with a recognition around the world so if you if someone wants to to market a product in english um somewhere other than in the uk for example then mm. a british voice lands well 
um, uh, you know, and American voices do too. I mean, it's not to, to, to do that. And I think in the US, British culture is, is they love it here. You know, mm. just look at the Downton Abbey effect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, and I'll, you know, you'll go into, I don't know, Walmart or somewhere and you'll be checking out and the checkout lady will go, I love your accent. Yeah. <laughs> I could listen to you all day. <laughs> to which my standard response is something along the lines of you couldn't afford me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, or it pays the bills or, you know, I'll, I'll say some, I'll, I'll quip. But uh, you know they they like it's it's liked it they love it, it's, yeah. You know, it lands with a, a a sort of I don't know a sophistication. Uh, um, you know it, I think I, I mean I do a lot of work in the corporate market where they want that that element of luxury, trustworthiness, sophistication. You know that kind of thing. In the same way, in if we were talking about cars. Um, earlier before we came on but you know jaguar aston martin it's you know it, it, it lotus you know we're famous for our luxury car brands and i think yeah. you know the voice i think we're known for our luxurious nature in fact to the extent that i have a showcase reel which it which is called luxury reel and it's focused entirely on promoting luxury products mm. and i book from it regularly oh, really? <laughs> I think I saw this on your your website, right? You have yeah. a personal website. Yeah, it's for my this. yeah, it's the key thing that I I have the yeah first demo you'll listen to on my audio only reels will be my luxury commercial demo. Yeah, yeah. So it seems it seems to have that association Britishness with luxury here. Um, yes, sophistication, uh, academia, uh, that, definitely that sort of thing. Yeah, they think we're smart. <laughs> um, <laughs> they <hate> you. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah, we try and only let the smart ones out. Um, <laughs> Do wonder that. <clears throat> so you've you've been in the United States now for well, definitely longer than me. <laughs> but, seven years, seven and a bit yep, years. Yeah. Yep. So I'm still counting the months, still counting the weeks, really. Um, and but it's not your first expat experience, right? No. Um, so tell me, what kind of first drove you to be a Brit abroad? Hmm. Um, I, I don't know what drove me other than I always had a hankering. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I was so uh, um, at college, we had an opportunity to go and play volleyball. I was a volleyball player. We checked, we had an opportunity to go and play uh, volleyball in what was then uh, Czechoslovakia in Prague. Mm. Um, this is in the early 80s. And we needed to raise 50 pounds each to go, which wasn't right. even then wasn't that much money. Mm. And we were being sponsored and we were going to be put up, blah, blah, blah. We couldn't get enough people raising 50 quid. And I always regretted that, that we didn't get to go to, to Prague. Um, uh, and then we went to uh, Holland to play volleyball. Uh, so uh, I did that, and then when I started work, there was an I was a, in finance, and there was an element of doing business with international clients, um, you know, through places like the Isle of Man and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, the Channel Islands. So I, I had some remote touches to living and working overseas, and I, I just hankered for it, and uh, I, I, I responded to uh, an advert in one of the trade press that said, uh, if you're interested in working overseas, and it listed all these places, the Caribbean, the Far East, Africa, you know, and Europe. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'll go to the Caribbean, no problem, give me a job. <laughs> to which I got stony silence. Um, but then someone said, um, it's not the Caribbean, but it's Europe. Do you fancy coming to Europe? Uh, and I went, yeah, I'll do that. And so I went to Europe. and. I loved it. Um, mm. Just uh, living and breathing a different culture, a different country. It's just so different than than visiting on holiday. Yeah, yeah. you just you, you can't possibly get a full understanding of what it's like to be in that country unless you live there. Uh, I see, see. And I think having done that once, and then finding myself in a situation where it 
we came back here and I'd married an American and there was always, always a plan that we would come and live in the States at, at some point. I think it happened sooner than we expected because of what went on in the mid naughty you know, not 2008 or something, credit crunch, everything happened maybe a bit sooner than we had planned. Um, but, you know, so yes, I've expatriated twice, three times if you include Scotland. <laughs> I, I, I was mentioning it, yeah, but being English in Scotland, that can be a cultural change as well. Well, as a, as a teenager, as an English teenager living in Scotland in the mid 70s, mm. when, you know, uh, it, it was dangerous to go to school in the early June when we had the home international soccer and England played Scotland. <laughs> it's dangerous to go to school as an English boy, you know, around that time of, of year. You know, there was a lot of, uh, in that at that point, enmity, you know, between yeah. the, between the two, but, you know, Scotland wanted independence and Edward Heath wouldn't allow it kind of thing. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so uh, different time, but maybe not so much. <laughs> well, yeah, and you wonder how things have changed really when you see what's going on now. But there you go. It's like when you watch Yes Minister, uh, and you have to remember it was made late seventies, early eighties, but every single issue is still pretty it's well. Still, yeah, still, <laughs> still pertinent. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are three interesting places: Europe, Scotland, and the United States. How does I mean? Does it compare? Do the three different places compare in terms of experience? Um, I, I guess uh, the, the both the Dutch and the Americans speak very good English. Mm. Uh, the Scots, I'm not sure. No, that, <laughs> that's, that's unfair. <laughs> so I've only expatriated to countries in which England English is is a spoken language. Um, I guess in Holland. That was one of the reasons why my, my the life in the expat life in Holland ultimately came to an end because uh, almost a decade in, it came to a point where either we had to fully integrate, and that meant speaking Dutch. Mm. You know, it wasn't you couldn't integrate ultimately. Whilst the Dutch speak brilliant English compared to to, to many European nations, um, living on a street with I don't know a hundred residents and. Maybe there's two families there that, that might have a, a you know an English participant, and the rest are Dutch, and and you'll get you know they invite you round and all the rest of it, and everybody will speak English to you, but you can't follow ninety percent of the conversations because they're in a language you don't speak, and you mm. so ultimately you have to integrate or not. And my eldest daughter was turning five, and uh, proper school was going to become an issue, yeah. uh, uh, and I couldn't. I couldn't face really ultimately as a father the thought of her coming home with homework and not being able to help her yeah because I didn't speak Dutch so so that led to to a, a, the change of moving back to it was either move back to the UK or move to the States at that point and uh, I was in wealth management and I had no US relevant qualifications so mm. they would have me uh, so I'm moving back to the UK so that's why we've at that point why we moved back to the UK. So that's a again quite a big change. Even though the countries are so close, and yes, they they do have good English, it is quite a change. And sometimes for some expats, going abroad for the first time is fine, but coming back can be a bit of a shock. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I think that is one of the big issues. I'm I do wonder whether I will ever be able to live comfortably in the UK ever again. Whenever mm -hmm. I go back, because you start seeing how how things in the UK don't sit with your personality as it's changed mm. by having lived in other countries. You see life in a different way, I think. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's, uh, I spent a long time outside the UK. And what I see is that obviously the UK isn't static. You know, it, it does change. The UK today is not the UK of the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. Mm -hmm. But it's changed in a way that you haven't seen. You haven't been part of that process. You've been left out. So for me, my idea of the UK is probably quite dated. Uh, mm -hmm. And so yes. I go back and I'm kind of surprised by things that are going on, you know. Yes. And I remember um, even very early on, having gone to to Holland, going back and visiting my friends in the UK, m maybe only months later, six months or a year. And um, my very good friend Andy and his friend Sarah, um, not Andrew and Fergie, not that Andrew and Sarah, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, I remember Sarah saying, you've you're you're just a little bit different mm. and this was it really only months later 
uh, that that having gone overseas and lived overseas and embedded into a different way of life had impacted me already even at that point I didn't notice it but they noticed it yeah I'm curious what were some of the big differences you noticed between say the Dutch and the English um... uh, the, the Dutch are famously quite blunt uh, <laughs> and, and set in many I mean a very it, it's an odd dichotomy a very very open on the face of it open society mm. they'll be very friendly to you very easily but it's quite difficult to get close to them as friends. I have one, okay. I have one Dutch friend mm. who I still have from living in Holland for almost 10 years. Uh, you know, and I, I'm sure that was language, at least in part. Mm. Um, but I felt an increasing need to embed more into the expatriate community there rather than right. the Dutch community. Mm. Because I found it quite difficult to make good friends. The other thing, uh, another example, uh, my one Dutch friend, Chavain, um, he, I, I, I visited him in his hometown, which was Nijmegen on the journey. All right. Yeah. Um, and we were crossing a busy road and he just walked out. <sighs> he just walked out and expected the traffic to stop for him, <laughs> you know, in a road that you or I would have probably stood on the edge of for 10 minutes waiting for a break. Mm. You just, you know, if you hit me, it's your fault was, was kind of, you know, uh, you know, same with the bikes. Yeah. The pedestrians and the bikes have right of way everywhere. <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, for me traveling around the world, everyone seems to have a different way of crossing the road. Um, yeah. like the Turks, often where I lived would do the same thing just walk out um it's a small place so maybe in Istanbul is quite different um but certainly where I was you'd walk out in front um in a place like Korea I've had friends from Japan Korea um you know almost like the Germans it, it was three o'clock in the morning there's nobody on the road you could cross straight over but instead you walk you know however many meters along to where the crossing is push the button wait for it to go over I once walked through an English town with a Korean and a Turk and it was chaos trying to stay <laughs> all stay together. <laughs> yeah, the Turks in the pub already. <laughs> <laughs> it's loosely trying to keep together, but uh, and in China, it's just you wait until there's enough pedestrians. When there's oh, really? genuinely fifty to hundred of you, you can go where you like. Um, but if there's just by yourself and the light's gone, well, yeah, I, I look twice. You know, I still look three times, four times. Uh, it doesn't matter what the light says. You have to go That's as a crowd. A little bit that here in the states as well. You know that whole jaywalking thing is quite yes. uh, ingrained in the per in the cultural personality that that you 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 cross at the right place at the right time. Um, and the law here you know, you're kind of breaking the law, you know. Yes. Uh, and and I don't I don't feel that. I'm like, if it's safe to cross, I'll cross. And exactly. My daughter will go. You can't do that. You can't do that. I'm like, yeah, I can. Look, I just did it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Dutchman in me coming out. Who knows? Uh. Yeah, the Americans love the car. So the car has right of way, it seems, at all times. Um, so, yeah, it's we do pick yes, up habits from other people. Well. We don't bike anywhere. Here. No. You know, we biked everywhere in Holland, you can imagine. I've seen families of five on one push bike. <laughs> you know, there'll be, well, there'll be a tandem bike, and yeah. then there'll be a kid on a little seat in, seat in the front, and there'll be a kid on the little seat in the back. And then they'll have one of those little trolley things that's attached with a kid sat in it, you know, being pulled all on one. So a whole, fa you know, and the bike lanes everywhere and, and so on. It's all very um, safe. I mean, it's not like, say, in parts of Asia where you might see the whole family on a bike and be slightly worried. I mean, Holland is all quite nicely done. Oh, <laughs> brilliantly organized. Yeah. Uh, for, for cyclists. If you want to be a cyclist anywhere in the world, I don't suppose there's anywhere better than uh, than Holland. I remember seeing a multi-story bicycle park. It's the only one I've seen in my life. Uh, it was in Holland. Yeah, <laughs> couldn't be anywhere else. Probably at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another skip all airport is brilliantly designed. Mm. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, well, the traffic there's a lot higher, a lot more now, I imagine, but so easy to get in and out of uh, as a, you know, as a commuter. Mm. Um, and you know uh, buses and trams and bikes and cars and you know different forms of transport everywhere but everything seamlessly integrating I and mean, it was brilliantly organized that is amazing 
you mentioned, you know, you, you travel around the world, you do pick up habits from different places that you've lived. Is it is it possible? Can you self-identify some habits that you picked up from the different places you've lived? Hmm, that's a really tough one. Probably not. I'm, I, I'm not very self-aware, I don't think, other than, you know, I think my, for a lot, very for aware of when someone tells you. I think other yeah, people, but maybe maybe the crossing the road thing is part of that. Maybe. I don't know whether I would have done that before. I don't know. It's impossible. I guess once you've changed, you might not know or notice that you've changed. Yeah. Um, As you mentioned, you went back and it was your friends who said something's different about it. something's different. Yeah. And I'm not sure. Uh, my dress code is probably different now. <laughs> you know? I live out Someone, in the country, so I've got to wear a little check woolly shirt, you know. <laughs> you are in the countryside, okay. <laughs> well, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not far from the town centre, but our house sits on a three-quarter acre plot. Oh, lovely. So oh, wow. I look out the windows and I've got, you know, if you see my Instagram today, with some people coming and chopping a tree down. Okay. Which they did yesterday. They took a whole tree down in about 30 minutes. So one uh, thing I noticed about the US is just space. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially California is very spread out, uh, which coming. Oh, hello. I knew that would be the highlight of the uh, interview. <laughs> no, I was just coming yes, from outside Hong Kong. So, very uh, true. Fred, you know, everything is tight in the UK. It's something my wife will, will talk about is the parking spaces uh, here are bigger and the parking spaces in the UK are small. And everybody parks on the street and nobody has a driveway. And all that, you know, she makes those things. Yeah, very much so. Would you say there's anything from the UK that you consciously bring with you. Um, a friend of mine commented that it could be meal times or at set times or afternoon tea. Um, I was talking to a few friends recently about fireworks night, mm -hmm. something you can't celebrate by yourself. I mean, oh, that's true. You just can't. Yes, you need you need to be intentional. Someone was really making this point with me that you need to be very intentional if you want to keep your culture with you, right? Uh, perhaps especially in an English speaking country, because then it's easy not to. Uh, yeah, and and here, um, you know, bonfire night happens so close to Halloween, mm. and Halloween is such a big thing here. Uh, it, so it, the, the, it, it, we we do typically get together with one or two British families. Um, All right. Uh, on on bonfire night, you know, and oh, wow. um, we, we're part of a an expat meetup group, and maybe three or four years ago, before the pandemic hit, um, we would get half a dozen 10 families and uh, one of one of the expat families well uh, uh, husband is American and wife is British uh, but they owned some farmland and mm. they all had all you know they would be, be gathering wood all year and we'd have this huge bonfire oh wow um, and and every we uh, it, what you would call a potluck now you know it's everybody would bring a dish and brilliant night brilliant mm. um uh, but it's become smaller, so because just circumstances have dictated, it's become smaller. Um, well, that is the first instance I've heard of of bonfire night being celebrated outside the UK as part of an expat community for oh, most okay. of us. Uh, yeah, no fireworks, just the bonfire. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, so for my friends in Chinese cities and a lot of built-up Chinese cities, it's illegal to have fires or bonfires or things like that. Um, and then some countries I've lived are quite dry, uh -huh. so again, there's regulations around it, but. Wow, that's interesting. That there was there was one one day. Uh, I'm going to say it must have been three years ago. It was the last one anyway, and it had been very dry here. Uh, and Tom, whose land it was, you know, he he kind of hovered all night with a hose pipe. <laughs> he was he was we were having it, but he you could tell he wasn't really very happy about us having Fair it. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's not a yeah, not a problem I've had in Yorkshire. Uh, couple of years we like two weeks beforehand we two of two fam our family and uh, another family that we're quite friendly with we would get together and make a guy like a big proper oh, okay. stuffed we would go to the goodwill or somewhere and buy some clothes and stuff it full of newspapers and actually make a proper guy uh, oh wow okay uh, uh, a few years yeah, I think I made a guy once in China, but I'm not allowed to set fire to it, so it seemed a bit strange. But uh, yeah. trying to educate the Chinese about what it is. But uh, again, you need to be intentional about these things. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so we have, I don't know what we'll do this year, if anything. 
I have a little fire pit which I built out in the garden, so we might hmm. roast some marshmallows or something. Ah, we'll have s'mores. Do they do s'mores on the East Coast? They do. I can't say I'm a big fan. I'm not a big Fair fan enough. of marshmallows either, but they... <laughs> <laughs> So you combine the British and American tradition there, I was thinking. Some, somewhat. I think they like the idea of sticking it on a on a bit of a twig rather, you know, and, and yeah. it's, it's 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 very sort of, you know, into the wild. It's as close as to into the wilds we're likely to get. <laughs> it's satisfying. If you could take one thing from the UK in your suitcase, whether it's a tea shop or an experience or anything, it's a magic suitcase. Um, ask, what would it be that you're bringing to where you are now? Um, I think over the years, the thing when we were when we first moved here, I think like a lot of people, there were you know familiar foodstuffs that, mm. that you miss that you you can't buy here so easily. Um, but over the years, that has reduced as you know we've we've discovered ways of making them. Mm. Um, uh, so you know I'll make pork I make pork pies now. Uh, for example, and just a couple of weeks ago, I I made golden syrup for the first. Oh. Uh, you made, made golden syrup. I'm that, sorry. No, I, I need to ask more questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's okay. It's not difficult. Um, but you you know you you've just got to be prepared to to take the risk. I suppose. I think the thing that I was most worried about when we came here was whether I would be able to get good cheese. Oh, okay. To the extent that one of my ideas was to become an artisan cheese maker, just so I could have good cheese. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, fortunately for the rest of the world, that never needed to happen. Um, found some good cheese suppliers. Yes. I, I don't know if you have it over there, but there are two uh, budget german supermarkets lidl and aldi yeah yeah um who have opened up here um certainly on the east coast they have a fairly substantial showing and and they bring very good cheese selections all oh, right okay uh so and and good bread with a proper crust ah which is the other thing that you know I do make my own bread, but I do love to find some good stuff out there as well. So. Yes. I, I, well, it's the other thing that I started, I've started making bread uh, as well um, because I wanted good bread. I don't make bread so much now because my 15-year-old makes it. Oh, lovely. You've trained She's her like, up. Dad can do it. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> she makes bread more often than I do. Oh, very enterprising. That's good. Yeah, I just got into jam making. Uh, yeah, we've not really not done that as yet, but we have we are so okay. What can we bring from the UK or what can't we get? Um, black currants, yes, yes, <laughs> seems extraordinary that in the whole of America, surely somebody wants to grow them. They, they seem to grow everywhere in the UK. Well, well, you see, we know why. Oh, I because don't. My wife looked it up, um, so many moons ago, I don't know exactly when. Um, so they brought black currants over and they were diseased or oh. they, they they became diseased or something. So and they spread the disease to, you know, uh, so they were banned because they carried this disease. Oh, OK. So that's broadly the story is. Huh. They wouldn't let them here because because they would bring some strange disease to the to the country. So okay. that's you don't see black currants grown here. I believe that that law has been rescinded and it is now allowable. You can now grow black currants, but I guess nobody has really caught and cottoned onto it as yet. If, if this could be a market, I could. If I can do yeah. it fast enough, I can grow the, black the America's leading black currant grower. <laughs> you, you probably. I imagine that there's a a climate issue. Um, you know, they grow voraciously in northern Europe, so you're probably going to have to be a bit further north. It's like rhubarb. Uh, you need to be further north to grow grow rhubarb. We we have a rhubarb crown, but it really struggles. All oh, right, okay. I've, I've lived in the rhubarb triangle in the UK, where the majority of our rhubarb comes from. <laughs> That's a rhubarb triangle. Oh yes, it's like uh, <laughs> Wakefield, Leeds, and York. Between that forms the triangle. Uh -huh. I've lived in the middle of that. Oh, um, okay, okay. Yeah, it's uh, yes, the rhubarb triangle. <laughs> so, we need a black currant triangle and a rhubarb triangle, clearly. 
far better than the Bermuda Triangle um, ways. Uh, beer was always a problem here, but oh. that's gone away. Artisan breweries are ten a penny now, so you can get a decent beer here now. Uh, so there's not much, really. There's not much that we can't get. Um, stately homes, there are not too many of those here. That's true. We, we live reasonably. We were very big, you know, National Trust property visitors, and mm. we lived near Blenheim in the UK. Oh. So. We had an annual pass there. We go to all the events there. Uh, so here we're relatively close to um, Biltmore. Uh, Biltmore House, bell, but... which is the largest house of it. It like, looks like a castle. Okay. Uh, it's in North Carolina. So we we have an annual pass there. We've been there. A few, we go there quite regularly. So we get our stately home fix from that. But there's not much more than that. So hmm. uh, I guess the extent of of if you like. Um, historical places to visit you know we, we anything more there's nothing much more developed that's more than 200 years old I mean, obviously there's a native american yeah culture and all of that there is history here that's much longer but you know that kind of european history going back mm. a and the of evidence of built structures like we're used to castles we're used to stately homes you know, right so. and you just don't have that here i think we miss that yeah I'd say that's true for me. I, here, of course, I'm lucky to have Spanish missions and so on, which is kind of interesting. They date back a, few, you know, a bit further. Um, but I'm impressed here how well they take care of their history. Mm -hmm. uh, like, if, if it's older, they will take care of it, uh, which I, I greatly appreciate. Yeah, but well, we're like in the middle of, of, of battleground world, you know, both the Civil War and the Revolutionary War. Mm. which we call the war of independence of course um uh, it's the battle in which we managed to gain independence from the americans uh, <laughs> uh so you know that, that we're just in that little bit north and south mm. carolina where a lot of those pivotal things happened uh, yeah and in fact my my father-in-law lives in a small town called cowpens 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 most brits have never heard of cowpens no I am most Brits, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, and I had never heard of Cowpens, but when I visited with my my wife for the first time to visit the family who live in Cowpens, they told me there were no. They would took great delight in telling me that Cowpens was famous for a for a battle, uh, in which the Americans whooped our proverbials. Oh. Um, uh, and in fact, you probably are familiar with the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson. I've heard of it. So the big battle at the end of that movie is broadly based on the Battle of Cowpens. Ah, and I remember it when it came out and it was uh, the usual Hollywood history. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and his character is broadly based on a, a local hero called Daniel Morgan. And there's okay. a big statue in the middle of Spartanburg, which, you know, Daniel to Daniel Morgan, who was All a right. big uh, American Revolutionary War hero. Oh. So, uh, kind of, that's where I live. I the the where live in. There is a bit of history there to, to explore. There, there is, but again, not much more than 200 years old because that's when it was all happening. So, you know, that sort of three and 400 year old castles and stately homes and so on is, I think mm. we miss that. I think you may know on my podcast, I often ask people for the, the alphabet of Englishness, you know, what, what is, what does A stand for, B stand for, C stand for? And I'm kind of, I'm often surprised how much of it is historically based, uh, especially from non-Brits, are very interested in English history. Uh, yes. I, I'm not a historian. I'm doing my best with this when they give me historical suggestions. I'm very aware that there are very good historians out there. But it does seem to be a, a feature of England that people are very interested in. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think when Americans visit the UK, mm. uh, it, you know, and there's a castle on every proverbial street corner, you know, yeah. you know and there's a... That, that you know there's a, a, a stratford on avon for example you know <laughs> the shakespeare theme shakespeare, village <laughs> it's, it's uh what 500 years ago you know and yeah. they, i think that uh the, you know the comprehension of that is they go oh my god you know yeah america it, it didn't exist different. then but of course it did but you know with the modern nation they weren't it? writing they weren't writing Shakespeare's plays back 500 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting. I come to America and I'm like, look at all this new stuff. Everything's really new. <laughs> you get the opposite reaction when Americans come to the UK. 
Yeah, and and I think that I mean the the thing I if I were to struggle with anything in the U.S. culture, it, it's the propensity for fast food. Mm. You know, it, as you approach any town, there's always going to be a road which has got neon signs everywhere, and you know it's nearly all fast food, and and mm. I find that um, a challenge. I find going out to dinner actually yeah. quite a challenge because you want. Well, healthy food. I, um, healthy food, or I want freshly prepared. You know, I want a dining experience. Yeah, okay. You know, and it, it does exist here. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't. That would be horrible to say it doesn't. There are restaurateurs who have that desire as well, and we have we you know, but and we've got two or three places that we like, and we'll go back quite regularly because it's very consistent and it's nice. It's well prepared. It's fresh ingredients. Blah blah blah. All that stuff. Mm-hmm. That you hear chefs banging on about. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Also, that's interesting that your your interest, say, if it's British culture that you bring over, is really our food culture. Um, and I, again, I've had an email from a, a gentleman in Bulgaria asking me about Britain's food culture, and it's something that it kind of has a bad reputation around the world. Which I certainly feel is unjustified. I wonder if it's Brits being self-deprecating, um, or, or how this has come about. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. He, my guess will be here's a, a guess for you that the things we're best known for, fish and chips and a British breakfast, are perhaps not the most healthy eating in the world. True. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and I think that's you, you know there's that sort of. Uh, perhaps not fair view of a British holidaymaker going overseas and looking for egg and chips, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not eating any of that foreign muck, egg and chips, you know. Um, and, you know, maybe that's part of you. And you, get, and you go to into a, you know, a, a town full of beautiful restaurants and you will have world cuisine represented. Mm. You know, you'll have Japanese and, and other Asian uh, things and, you know, Spanish and all this. You rarely will find, a, you you'll, might find a British pub serving fish and chips and pie and chips and that kind of thing. Uh, but you won't really see a British restaurant. Yeah, yeah. As you say, it's more likely an Irish pub. More likely an Irish <laughs> pub, yeah. <laughs> yes. A, a pet peeve of my of my daughter's is that you'll go into an Irish pub uh, and they'll offer shepherd's pie, but it'll be made with ground beef. Ah. She's like, shepherd's pie is lamb. Beef is cottage pie. Yeah. You know, so she's she always remarks there's certain things that she'll remark upon you know. fair enough I, I make my own again like yourself this is the way yeah. i deal with uh it makes you very self-reliant i guess living abroad yeah I, but I, you know i've always been uh a cook ah, okay I've always had an interest in food uh and i'm you know at, at university i was the one that was you know back in the days where you lived in a dorm and you had a shared kitchen oh I, I still did that, but I, I am living in Yorkshire. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, now I see. But uh, you know, you get uh, we we toured un- universities in the UK and here for my eldest daughter. Mm. They also had a thought about going back to the UK, but didn't. Um, and they have these things now. You turn up as a as a first year student, and you must live in dorm, and you must buy a food package, and you oh. have to eat in the you know you they, they don't have these things with shared kitchens it seems oh. so much anymore at least that's my experience of it but when i went to college that was what you, you lived in a very basic yeah. dorm and and uh there was a shared kitchen and mm. so uh we would gather together and there would be two or three people in our 12 18 year old pimply youths um and uh we had a uh we had a guy from where was Sunil from? I'm going to say he was from Birmingham, uh, but he would bring his mum's homemade green tomato curry paste ah. with him, uh, and in big Nescafe jars, the big yeah. catering size ones. So we would quite regularly cook uh, curries as a group, um, and then I would go and I would buy a whole chicken and vegetables from the market, and I would roast up a chicken on a Sunday. 
and have a little mini roast dinner for myself and then the rest of the carcass would be made into soups and pies and you know what else and it would feed me for the rest of the week you know good stuff i'm surprised that it's changed um changed so much that's my understanding certainly here certainly here that's the expectation you Mm. you know you have to live in dorm on the first year and there didn't seem to be any shared kitchens that i saw that's a useful life skill i mean yeah you would think Absolutely. <laughs> and a useful skill, as I say, as we say, for an expat, it's very useful because you can recreate that home, that home feeling. Yes. Um, yes. The one thing we haven't really been able to buy here with any uh, ease. Well, you can buy it off places like Amazon, but eye wateringly expensive in relative terms is the cereal shreddies. Oh, right. OK. We like yeah. shreddies, and we will bring back shreddies from the UK. Ah, for me, it's suet. Um, suet. Get suet to make a nice pie uh, yeah. but again I've, I've gone straight for the Amazon route on that I can't find it anywhere else or shops that have heard of it um, yeah well, beef suet it'll be beef suet yeah. a tour of beef suet yeah uh, I guess they would use shortening here as a Crisco would be the nearest equivalent probably which is some art of gloop <laughs> okay maybe I won't test it out um, <laughs> so if cooking is one essential skill of a of a Expat generally, what, can you think of any other useful traits, useful skills for Brit living abroad? Oh gosh, um, no, no. I mean, I, I, I think, um, I think you have to have an open mind. Mm. Is what I think you have to have. You have to be open to successfully expatriate. You have to be open to the culture you're moving into. Yeah, because they're not going to change just for you. You've got to be more sure. willing to bend with the wind than the, the, the culture will. You know, yeah, so you might moan about fast food alley, but it's not going to change because I want it to. No, no. So you have to be prepared to bend with the wind. That's a yeah. fun part of uh, of being abroad as uh, well, being open minded. You that's deal with it, but people... also. So when I was when I had when I was in Holland and we had and I was dealing with expatriates on a business basis and it, you know, there's a quite a high, probably a 25 percent, maybe even a 30 percent fallout rate of people who attempt to expatriate and don't succeed. They miss home too much. And yeah. want to go home. Uh, so it's not for everybody. No, uh, definitely. Uh, and and, you know, that doesn't mean that hankering for home is a bad thing Mm. um but i think to successfully expatriate and especially to more than one country as you and i have both done um is you you there has to be something of a of an acceptance of of the culture you're moving to yeah um i've never i've actually never been to asia um you know i'm sure the culture there is again markedly different it can be um i mean my first thought is yeah i worked in saudi arabia and i worked with the most conservative islamic clerics in saudi arabia so yes the culture can be very very different and uh, and as you say they're not going to change for you um they are very much what they are um and what can you say sometimes have the attitude of that's for thee not for me um, yeah <laughs> yes yes and if, you can't, if you can't stand the heat you have to get out of the kitchen as they say (laughs) sounds very gordon (laughs) ramsay i've never never seen a british restaurant but i have seen gordon ramsay's and uh was it jamie oliver but only in a few places like hong kong we get a huge number of british expatriates yes he has opened something in florida i think Right, I'll book my tickets. Um, Probably a fish and chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> if you did fish and chips, I'm sure it would be all right. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. For me, there's a dish called a fat rascal, which um, I don't know if you've come across this. It's like a it's a type of cookie, I guess Americans would call it, which is uh, famous in Yorkshire. Um, but my brothers used to go to Betty's Tea Shop and get one um, fairly regularly. I used to have one. And when we moved away from Yorkshire, somebody actually gave us a recipe to make them Uh, so as i travel around the world it's been one of my joys it's pretty good it's good for me um i shall be looking that up no i'm not familiar with the fat rascal it's um 
but I, I did I did live nearby uh, in Scotland. I lived near Stun near near a town called Stunhaven, just south of Aberdeen, uh, where there was a, a fish and chip shop that that made the first deep fried Mars bar, or at least claims to make have made the first deep fried Mars bar. So, Famous around the world. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, and they'll deep fry anything now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I for that Scotland, to be talking a lot about food. <laughs> yeah, that's a big part of, I guess, culture generally is. Uh, I mean, as I say, I hear of the Scots battering everything. I think it was a, a gentleman from Tennessee who told me that in Tennessee they have battered butter. Really? <laughs> uh, I, I feel that crossed the line that even the Scots wouldn't cross. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a difficult one. Be all right. So maybe, maybe food. Maybe as a as an expat, that's what we can focus on. Uh, good food. I suspect that at least something you, you deeply ingrained in our cultural being is, you know, the food reminds you of home. Mm. I, I think, you know, that's the that it warms the, the cockles of your heart. Uh, so I think that there is an element of that. Um, but I've got to say, I don't, you know, the, the, the big win here is like you were talking about earlier about the space, you know, and I, I, I don't think I could have had this second career in the way that I have had it without mm. space. Uh, oh, right, yeah. You know, I, I've got this room, you know, this is a standard sort of bedroom size, sort of, you know, 12 by 12 or something like that, 14 by 14. And I've got a six foot by four foot room inside the room, which is, mm. you know, according to you. So, I, you know, I have a setup here which allows me to produce audio as good as, as a, you know, as a broadcast studio. Wow. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah, and, and you couldn't, if you think about how tightly we live together in the UK, it's much harder. I see my colleagues in the UK and they have a lot a lot more issues with external noise, um, you know, than, than I do. Uh, yeah. You know, I've got enough space between me and the neighbours and, mm. you know, uh, I don't have the same kind of problems. Ah, so that's a big boon. <laughs> yeah, it's a big win. It's a big win. Um, and uh, I talk about the other value, you know, you referenced earlier about why, why is the British voice, um, uh, the, why does it land well in the US? And for me and the other Brits here, um, we, have a, we have other wins, like uh, we're only a maximum of three hours different mm. from one side of the country to, to another. So someone in LA wanting a British voice if they wanted to hire from the UK and they, you know, there's a scheduling issue with yeah. hours time difference. Um, in fact, I, I picked up a, uh, a job recently, it came down to two people, uh, me here and the companies here, um, and, uh, a, 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 a voiceover who's resident in New Zealand. And one of the key things that got me the gig was there was an only, only an hour time difference. Mm. You know, and five hours to the UK. So there were three people from the UK and two people from the US, uh, you know, it, it, on the call with me, you know, and, and scheduling that with New Zealand was just going to be an extra step too far. And I think not that my voice wasn't good enough, <laughs> but I think scheduling played to my advantage. Yeah. Um, and then there are things like, you know, um, uh, dealing with payments and, and, and taxes, uh, you know, when they hire me here as a as a local guy, they, I'm just within the tax system. They can send me a 1099, and it's and I can provide them with a W9, and it's all familiar, and they don't have to yeah. deal with something that they might not be necessarily that familiar with. And it's interesting. I assume you're not doing American voices in America. You are doing a British voice, South African voice. Um... I've been hired. I've been hired in over 25 different accents. Oh, really? British regional and international English accents, including American accents. Ah. But I don't, I don't promote it at all. Okay. I need it. I, I, you know, and I, I think to myself so here, if my biggest market is the US, there's several tens of thousands of native American speakers who do it better than I do. Fair enough. Um, I, why would I choose to compete? with that <laughs> and, and in many ways marketing yourself as a niche is much easier mm. you know the, the you're you're not you're not crying in the wind with the other masses yeah um i do do business in the uk but not nearly as much as i do in the rest of the world 
Mm. And it's good to know that a British voice or British accents are very much in demand in the rest of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have faith. It's, it's, it's good because it's true. But the first paid voiceover job I ever did was for a guy in New York. Mm-hmm. The second one I ever did was for someone in New Zealand. Oh, wow. You couldn't <laughs> get further apart. You know? yeah. And I am a product of the Internet world mm. and the ability to to set up, you know, a broadcast quality facility in your home, which yeah. maybe even 10 years ago, you probably couldn't do. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, very impressive. So. It, well, it sounds it. It's 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 not. <laughs> careful what I say. It is, it is it's impressive. It's not that difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of figure if I can do it, anyone can do it. You know. <laughs> I'm thinking was it Jim Carrey was asked what's your advice to young aspiring actors, and he was like, "Don't go for any role that I'm going for because I'm going to get it." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's mountains, veritable mountains of work, if you're willing to, to work hard enough. You know, I, I was asked about the secret to my success and nothing more than hard work, really. You know, I get up in the morning, the studio's open at eight o'clock in the morning. I'll typically work through till about six o'clock in the evening. And, you know, I try and avoid weekends and evenings if I can. But if scheduling dictates... You know, the one mistake I made, um, I had a client from New Zealand wanted me for something to do with uh, replacement windows, I think it was. And they wanted a live directed session. And they said, is Friday morning OK? And I'm, yeah, no problem. Friday morning, no problem. <clears throat> and then he sent me the scheduling. And of course, it was Friday morning, New Zealand time. Which was, I think, eight o'clock at night here. Oh, OK. Uh, so I'm like, OK, yeah, not a problem. Uh, the previous day, so it was now Thursday, eight o'clock in the evening on a Thursday. Just so happened it was that one Thursday of the year in America when nobody works. It was Thanksgiving. And I completely <laughs> walked past that. So uh, so I had to gather with the family and, you know, knowing that I had to. So we typically go to my father-in-law's and his family for, for Thanksgiving, you know, and there's like 50 people and all that kind of thing. Uh, and I had to leave that, come home, do a recording session with New Zealand and then go back again, you know, oh. two hours later. Um, so not that it's a big journey, but it, you know, yeah, yeah. I couldn't have a beer and a glass of wine with everybody. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the one scheduling issue that, that I missed. I walked past that. I missed that one. Um, I'm a bit more sensitive to it now. But even Central Europe, you know, six hours time difference can create scheduling issues. Yeah. Um, you know, my character Locke we've talked about. So the Starbreeze, the studio there in Stockholm. So there's a six hour time difference. Okay. So when we're recording for him, typically uh, it'll be half past seven, eight o'clock in the morning here. So we're starting and it's uh, what, two o'clock in the afternoon for them. You know, mm. just about make it work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. much later, and because you need two hours typically. And if we started any later, then they're working overtime. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you don't so want to force your client into that. Certainly don't want to do that. <laughs> they love me, and I love them. It's okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me your perspective on being a Brit abroad and for bringing British voices well to the world. First, New Zealand, America, Stockholm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, it's all. To, it's, it's, it's the internet's fault. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for the internet as a voice, I wouldn't exist. As a voice actor, I wouldn't exist. In which case, I'm very glad it does exist. <laughs> not so glad as I am. <laughs> and not I'm just for the... about Bond you... hardly at all. <laughs> oh, it, I, we could just quickly tack on. You've seen the new film, I believe. I, I saw a picture yeah, of you yeah. at a cinema. Um, yeah. It's be done. Dare I ask, what do you think? What do you think of it? You don't want spoilers, do you? No, no, not spoilers. <laughs> Otherwise, I, have to delay I thought it was a story. great movie. Oh, okay. Really good movie. Um, very moving. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and Daniel Craig was a really good Bond. Yeah. He's uh, done a wonderful tenure and for so long. Uh, yeah, he really has. And so uh, my 15-year-old, um, that was the first Bond movie she's seen. Gosh. Uh, and so uh, that immediately led her to, I want to see more. And oh, so really? we, have, we have Casino Royale uh, on DVD from the library. 
Um, mm. And we shall be watching them. We may even watch that tonight in your honour. You know what? <laughs> you, you've hit on one of the biggest questions in like the Bond community, which is, you know, young people coming in to the films and, and what's, you know, would it grab them? Does it grab them? So that's that's wonderful to hear. Um, yeah, I, 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 I haven't seen any of the older films for a long time. Um, and I wonder how they will date. Um, yeah. You know, uh, it, we live in a world now that is much more sensitive to some of the shenanigans that the old bomb <laughs> get up to, you know. And I uh, and I, I fear for that. If I were to go back and watch them, would I would I enjoy them as much? Um, but I, I think for, I, I'm old enough that that Connery is probably still my favourite Bond. Mm. Um, and there was a there was a certain gritty darkness to to his bond yeah that that daniel craig also has yeah and i think all the other bonds in between it, it perhaps particularly with roger moore it became almost a comedy mm. uh and and i prefer the slightly more gritty version of bond yeah um but uh, i read all the books voraciously as a teenager oh, did you oh, okay yeah um, I've seen a lot of the books in the latest one. I I read them, and reread them, and I and I really very much enjoy them. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're very readable books. Mm. Yeah, so, not too long. <laughs> well, I, never... I know, and they are. They're they're. I don't know. You might call them airport fiction, might you? They're yeah. they're, they're 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 easy reads, but they're good stories. They're rollicking they good stories. It's one of my favourite things is how condensed, how concise he is. That very few people are able to imitate this. Um, I think it's been a big challenge for continuation writers uh, that he just has a style that's it's quite acrid. Um, yeah, yeah. I read a couple of the one of the of the post Fleming books, and I just didn't enjoy them as much. And well, not not read another one since. <laughs> so much, yeah, so much is just the writer's style, right? It's just how he how he speaks. Um, and I some when I read them, you know, I'd heard people say, "Oh, it was all acceptable back then," you know. It was all fine back then. And I read them and I thought, it really wasn't. <laughs> it was really quite and, shocking at the time. I, I, I'm, I have enjoyed reading all of Lee Child's uh, thrillers. And he has a very, although his books are set in the US and it's a US hero, uh, he's British, uh, but he has a very blunt acerbic style as well, which I've really enjoyed uh, reading. Sorry, I'm being, hello. Dinner. I want being called to dinner. Well, I'm not going to interrupt that. So we talk about the importance of oh, food. Oh, five minutes. Like, I have five minutes. I have five Fantastic. minutes. <laughs> okay, then if you have five minutes, I I feel I asked you all the questions that I was really burning to ask you. Oh, but are there any questions you'd like? You as well, I wanted, So when I started out, there were a couple of voiceover casting platforms out there where where they separate you from the client. Uh, I, I my voice is in a Bond video game. Oh, somewhere. I just don't know which one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was maybe half a dozen lines for an M like character. And if you can remember half well, no, what I the didn't, line is. I never knew. I never knew the title of the game. But if you remember the line, then I'm sure there's somebody watching who knows the games well enough. Uh that would be an interesting challenge. I will have the audio file somewhere, but it'll just be a reference number. Um, oh. So I'd, I'd have hundreds of files to go through, to, <laughs> um, which I'm not sure I'm prepared to do. But I thought I'd enough, mention sorry. that. I thought I would mention you. I have been in a Bond uh, thing. I just don't know where. Somewhere. Somewhere. Well, the James <laughs> if there are any video is... game developers out there, I'd <laughs> dearly love to be in another Bond game. I really would. That'd be okay. a, that'd be a highlight. <laughs> if it's on the right, the right podcast, and the right video, there might be somebody who just, just hears the tone that. of your voice and might have be able to guess. So. Uh... Yeah, I, I'm thinking it was um, uh, when when Fines took over as M. Uh, so uh, when was that? 2015. Yeah, that'd be about right. That'd okay. be about right. Uh, right. Because if you think about it, I started in 2014 as a voice actor. Oh, okay. So that'd be right. That'd be about right. Yeah. Right. So he he the, the, the which movie was that? Which was his first Bond? Guy Four was his first. Skyfall. Yeah. Which is a re another really good movie. Uh, okay, so it must have been after Skyfall. 
Yeah. Uh, so it must be a game that was released after Skyfall. I might be getting my dates wrong, so it could even be Spectre if it's 2015. So, yep, 2015. Yeah. Sorry, it was Spectre. Fine comes in in Skyfall. So, wow. So it's a fairly recent game. Well, it's six years, isn't it? It was 2015. There haven't been a lot of Bond for, uh, Bond games, so uh, so it's actually oh, okay. a very limited number. And there's okay. one in well, development now, so it might even be the one coming. No, it won't be no? that. It has no. been used. And voiceovers are voiceovers are stack it high, fast moving business. Okay. Uh, and voice actors, particularly, we're often the la- you know you've, you've you've got you've the jigsaw, you put all the edges around, you've pulled filled in all the picture, yeah. and the corporate CEO or whoever's in charge of the project is in the front going, yes, here we are, here's our finished thing, it's great, it's wonderful. Then someone at the back goes, what about the voice? And he goes, good, I'm glad you noticed. Off you go, find a voice for it. And we're the last piece, and we oh. often don't see the script until the day before or the day of. Uh, you know, really last minute stuff. So, uh, from six years ago, it, it was, you know, wh- whatever I recorded was used and placed in the game within days of, 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 uh, and now whether the game was released within days, probably the game, the game would have been maybe a month later or two months later. But I could probably, if, if I worked hard enough at it, I could probably isolate a time period, huh. uh, which might be worth doing. I'll do that. Yes. I'll come back to you. I'll message you. And 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 then you can see if you can find it. <laughs> I feel it is now a race between you getting that information and people in the comments who already know that much about Bond games. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, yeah, I haven't anybody's been got any good suggestions. I played a Bond-like character, probably with broadly this voice, uh, and and there were only like half a dozen lines, so it might have even been just an opening cutscene kind of thing. Yeah, been the only cool. thing that they appeared in. Might not have been in-game lines, but I don't know. So. Then, uh, then what can I say? Take care out there in the field. Um, <laughs> good yeah. luck with your next mission. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm tempted to do the Mission Impossible thing, yeah, but I won't. Oh, please don't self-destruct. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for your time. I've enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Take care.